Groovy.net was the first tree in an Active Directory forest. And so one of the things you can do, it's pretty quick and easy to, to work up, is to just Google you know, forest, domain, active directory, and then look at images, right? So this might be a good graphic, but sometimes it's, it's good to pull in other, other graphics. Like right here, you have acme.net, and then you have europe, eu.acme.net. It's kind of, kind of hard to see, but Essentially, you have this thing that's called a schema. And within each domain, by the way, there are organizational units. So in terms of the structure of Active Directory, you, you need at least one tree and one forest. So when you set up the first domain, that becomes the first domain and the first tree in the forest, the, do, the forest domain or domain forest. And let's see if I can get a bigger screen here. So you have this root domain like groovy.net, and then you have students.groovy.net, and faculty.groovy.net, and staff.groovy.net. And because the same root is involved, groovy.net in each case, this is all technically one tree in the forest. And if we had myuvi.net sitting next to this, like the, the myuvi.net uh, remote access accounts, if we had groovy.net and myuvi.net, that's another tree with potentially parent-child branches, right? And so you'd have uh, two trees in the forest. But if you have just one tree and just one domain, that's also the, the beginning of a forest. And forests can establish trust relationships. You can establish a trust with a realm. And, and that's one of the best ways to op interoperate with Active Directory in Linux because the security for the realm is managed separately, but it can be aligned with where you have common security groups and you have common memberships and security groups. So if somebody's over in the Linux realm or they're over on the AD side, they're in the security group over here, which tracks with or maps to the same security thing over there. And so I, I just wanted to spend a little more time to explain uh, what that's about. Once again, you know, just Google this and then, and then take some time to, to take a look. So it's all about DNS. And uh, it's often helpful. So here you have blue.com and red.com. You have sales.blue.com, PR, public relations.blue. Over here you have accounts in red and engineering. So these are child domains of the parent domain. Or put another way, this is the trunk and the roots of the tree, the blue.com tree, and the trunk and the roots of the red.com tree, and these are the branches of the tree. And if, you know, whenever you start an Active Directory, whenever you configure the first domain in, in an Active Directory context for your organization, it becomes the first tree in a forest. And it, you make trust relationships between forests and realms, not between domains and realms. So you can't go directly between a domain and a realm, but you can go between, a, you can establish a trust between a forest and a realm. Does that make sense? Maybe, kind of, sort of. Takes a little while to get used to. Yeah, it's still, it's still trying to map it out. 
So here's a good Just example. Of, here's a good example of some trusts. So external trust between two domains and different forests. So you're, if you're within Active Directory, you can establish trust between two different domains in different forests if it's all Microsoft. But then you have these, these trust types. And um, yeah, you can get, a, they can become very elaborate, but basically there's this whole idea of Kerberos. There's a parent child trust between the, so there's an, there's a, an inherent trust between child and parent. So if you have a tree, these domains trust each other because they're related. Um, and then you have all these different kinds of trusts that imply things. One of the important uh, elements of authentication and access has to do with Kerberos. And Kerberos is a technology that was originally developed by MIT and it's used in Linux and in Active Directory and in Apple, you know, Apple uh, realms. So, uh, but that ties into the NTFS permissions, privileges, and inheritance. It's how you authenticate. So Kerberos is a way to centrally authenticate your login. And then when you go to the different servers in the domain, you have this thing called a ticket that tells the server what you're entitled to access. And so Kerberos is, uh, it's time sensitive and it's DNS sensitive. And that's why the date time group is so important between servers and a, and a directory. But it, it's worth exploring a bit on your own. Um, I didn't want to get too far into it in the study guide, but I wanted you to be aware of it and what it is. And I, I wanted to speak a little bit more about that before we I want to show you some graphics that go with the text here. Okay. Are there any quick questions about realms, forests, trusts? No, I think I got it now. Okay. Yeah. So automatically a child domain trusts a parent domain, but if you're putting if you're going outside the forest, then you create an external trust, right? And that's it's a little different. So it's not an automatic trust, it's an intentional trust. And that's where you can have those uh, same security groups and, and uh, map things. So the early file system limitations, this is something that is significant to mention. So you have different operating systems. And if you, if you access files and directories between different types of file systems, depending on how those are saved or accessed or modified, you can lose some of the attributes that, didn't I say something about this on Tuesday? So if you, like if you're in Linux, you're using ext4. If you're an NTFS, if you, a lot of times people when they're working between operating systems, they use an older file system type on the common volumes. It's called the file allocation table file system or FAT. That's hails back to the old days of DOS, one of the first operating systems. And, uh, to make a long story short, it's a very basic um, read, modify, and uh, owner. The, the basic permissions for FAT are very simple. You don't get the same kind of permissions and privileges that you do for NTFS. So if you transfer files and resources between systems, you have to be mindful of what may happen to attributes once it's ported into another environment. So the key term there is ported. If you're porting over a file or directory from Linux into NTFS, some of the attributes that you're assigning using change mode or change own, right, ownership, some of those may or may not come across. Any questions before we move into our slides? No questions? Okay, 
So let's look at uh, lecture 14, IO devices. I'm just going to hit the. Not from me. What I'm what I'm going to do is note the things on each slide that you should you should um, understand oh. or know about, and then uh, I'm going to go back and create a notes like a a reader notes addendum, and it'll it'll say things like check status, send data and control, slide two, right? So I'll I'll break out the lecture series and which slide number and which terms. You, sh you should know about, but, but we'll do that now together. So the fact that it's a device, you have to have the status of the device, you have to be able to send data to and from the device, and you have to be able to control those operations. Is that a sensible thing? It seems so. Yeah, I mean, if you didn't, if, you, if a hard disk wasn't connected, like you had an external thumb drive or you know, if it wasn't powered on, you'd have an issue. So just in terms of sheer functionality, that's, to me, that's a very sensible approach, right? And, and I want you to, I want you to understand um, those basics for the device. Okay, so the idea that you have hardware that interacts with the operating system, remember the operating system sits between hardware and applications. We covered this in our first module. Everybody knows that, right? So one of the most important things to understand about input output devices is that the hardware is a privileged access. It requires elevated privileges. It's often handled at the kernel level and older versions of operating systems didn't do this very well. So they crashed a lot. So you wanna be able to do this plug and play thing. We mentioned that in the study guide. Um, this is another graphic from the study guide, basic diagram of, of the arrangement of resources and access for the file system. If we're talking about a SCSI bus, that's on which, which bridge, North Bridge or South Bridge? Does anybody remember? I want to say South. It is South, yeah, South Bridge, good. Okay, so device registers, right? In, in memory, when you're reading to device registers, you have status, command, and data. We're talking about memory registers. Here's another view of what that might look like. I think we did this in computer architecture. Did I not show you, like, you could go into this and then go into properties. Okay, it doesn't show it here. Let me find another one. Uh, I think, I think USB. Or a network card. Now let's try the network card. Yeah. Okay. Resources tab of the device manager. So if you pull up the properties of the device in device manager, and you access the resources tab, it's going to specify uh, memory address ranges and the interrupts for the memory. Uh, this should ring a bell. It should be like this faint thing that we, uh, you might, I'm pretty sure we try to cover this in every computer architecture course, but part of access with IO devices is that you have specified memory ranges or address ranges for a given device. It's part of the API, the application programming interface for, and uh, the reason that's significant, let's look at mice. So if you have a mouse, right, you can, that's useful information. You don't see a resources tab here. So that gives you an idea of where the devices sit in terms of their, uh, how, how much in the weeds on the hardware level they are. Um, all right, enough of that. Let's go back to this. So just remember that you have specific memory registers that are associated with a device. And those are important for hard disks. So interrupts are particularly important for hard disks. 
Um, we mentioned that when it comes to disk I.O. that you can have a subsystem that includes a CPU and extra RAM. Everybody remembers that. That should already be in the study guide. Um, so your status, um, you know, busy would be a type of status. That's just an example of a status in the registry. Um, so I need you to stop me if you want me to explain more. So here we have two registers, A and C, and there's, uh, you're basically accounting for, you're accounting for where the data is and the status. Um, I'm not really sure, all right, so the way he's representing this is a little different than I would. I'm not so worried about these slides. Just understand that busy is a status attribute, okay? So busy would mean you have to wait. So that, all right, so this is where it's significant. All that other stuff on the previous slides, on slide 18, the important thing you wanna understand about status is if you're engaging a device that is busy, meaning it's reading other data or writing other data, you have to, there has to be a wait mechanism. You have to be able to account for weights and that's where interrupts come in with devices. Has anybody ever heard the interrupt term before? I don't believe so. Okay. So interrupt request, IRQ. So the network card has an interrupt request designated, right? And this is in hex. So it has an established memory register address range and it has an established interrupt. So interrupts come into play when you have to put something on pause while it's waiting. The whole purpose of managing device access, input and output, it's really in the weeds, but I, I want you to understand this idea of an interrupt. If we look at a disk, a hard disk, and come on now, is it the disk controller? Maybe it's in here. So, oh, there's the resources tab. Okay, so you have input output ranges for the controller. Did I miss it up here? There was a resource tab or no? No, there wasn't a resource tab. Um, maybe it's up on this level. Nope. So depending on where the resource allocation is uh, provisioned, sometimes you have to fish around, but if you go into the resources tab, at some point you should be able to identify an IRQ. There's an IRQ 13 that uh, was really common with IDE drives. And so there was some kind of history about IRQ 13 and if you wanted to crash a system and you had a program that was ill-behaved with the interrupts, if you were coding for software to optimize file system and disk level access, if you weren't careful about the memory ranges and the IRQs, it would crash things. But, but IRQ 13, I, I believe, is a dedicated interrupt for disk I.O. in particular. Any questions about the whole idea of interrupts meaning you're waiting because something's busy nope no that was clear. good i'm glad okay so are interrupts ever worse than polling they're talking about different ways of checking on the status um yeah i'm not going to go into polling a whole lot because you're going to be dealing with a lot of address ranges and interrupts and uh I'm sure that in certain contexts, polling is important, but that's not gonna be something we're worried about. This is important, and this is also in your study, study guide. So you have this, this uh, device IO versus direct memory access. 
if you have DMA, instead of working on a lower level with interrupts, basically what you have is the, the, the mechanism to directly offload and upload chunks of data into and out of RAM directly, direct memory access. It's a very important performance enhancement, especially where certain data bus slots are concerned. So this I idea of DMA, it's a, the thing I want you to understand about DMA is that it is a performance enhancement, direct memory access. It's a direct flight between the disk and, and uh, yeah, okay. Any questions about DMA? No. None from me. Okay. So, yeah. So programmed I.O., you're working coded statements with the memory addresses and the interrupts, and you are you have device drivers. They're virtual representations of the actual hardware. That's what's happening on the hardware level. You're not directly accessing the hardware directly. You're accessing an address memory range and an interrupt, which represents, it's a virtual representation of the physical device. That's old school. This is legacy, right? And, and this DMA improves the efficiency of uh, data to and from memory. That's pretty much what that slide means. Um, so status checks that would have to do with disk availability. Remap I.O. special Let's see if there's anything else in this that really matters. Ah, okay. So this is a cool s factoid, right? What slide are we on? 31. We're on slide 31. So I'm going to call that out in the reading notes. Drivers are 70% of the Linux source code. Wow. <laughs> That's significant. So the whole idea of hardware IO is a big, big thing, but it's the most critical when it comes to fixed hard disk and file system access because that's where the persistence stands or falls on its own merits. And, and the, the stability of your hardware drivers is really critical. And of course, Linux is trying to play in a, it's trying to play in a, in a space where Windows is, you know, Windows wants to serve everyone, all these different device types. Um, so a lot of times when you're working with Linux and you need to, so this is something we'll get into in the next, the last module, but there are specific drivers that are tuned into, and I'm using those words explicitly, tuned into the kernel of the operating system. And when you load the drivers, you're actually changing the kernel of the operating system. Uh, to a certain extent, this is also true in Windows. If you load certain signed drivers uh, for uh, system level, like motherboard level, controller level, hardware, uh, some of that can actually be written into the kernel. So a lot of the operating system source code is devoted to the hardware. But the, you know, I'd say the most critical one are the dr drivers um, for hard disk. In fact, it's a common practice in IT in tech spaces where if you end up in trouble and you have a system that started to get flaky and you haven't had other software updates and you, nobody knows why, they're all scratching their heads. Oh, you've done all the updates. You've done all the patches and fixes. You've optimized your personal technology, but things are getting flaky and they're crashing. One of the protocols is to first upgrade the firmware in the BIOS on the motherboard. That's its own operating system of sorts. Does everybody know what I mean by BIOS, basic input output system? This was something we... Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, I, want, I want to say that's something we covered in computer architecture. And then you update the device drivers for the motherboard. So there's, there is a chipset driver, which is associated with the CPU. Intel has chipset drivers, and those can be updated. 
So, so you go out to the, you know, you go out to the manufacturer's website and you look it up and then you update the video drivers. And that's because the chipset drivers and the video drivers are sitting on the North bridge and it's high performance and it can muck up the timing. It's kind of like a high performance race engine. Are any of you like into like fast and furious kind of stuff? I watched the movies, but I ain't really. Okay. You know, you know, you can change the timing of a car to make it higher performance. Yes. The timing of the engine. Mm, I didn't know. Okay. Well, in general terms, you can overclock. Have you heard this term? You can overclock a motherboard or the RAM. I think I've heard it before. Yeah, overclock. Okay. Well, so, so often what what happens is that people are trying to fine tune their RAM and their their uh, video performance, and that's tied into the chipset very closely. And what often happens is that the system will lock up or crash. And that's because it's stepping on the lowest level drivers just outside that arena, which would be like the first, the first in line on the South bridge are the disk drives, right? So I just want you to, I want you to understand how big of an investment there is on the operating system level to code for devices and, and how significant the one input output for hard disks is critically situated. Right. It's like the first in line, that diagram I had at the top here. Where is it? All right, we're on slide 31. So let's go back up here. Is it this one? No, this one, this one. So if this is the south bridge and that's the north bridge, right? If you're, if you're doing performance tuning, you're overclocking, that kind of thing. It's typical that the priority access on the south bridge is uh, reserved for hard disk because of its critical nature. And so it's the first one to get gummed up. And when you can't move data in and out, you can't read it in and out, you got a blue screen. And that's a topic we'll get into in the next module. Okay, so that was uh, slide 31. Yeah, so uh, driver and hard drive. So we were just talking about how important it is for the drivers to function properly. Um, I will say this, I'm, I'm gonna put in a plug for Macintosh systems. Does anybody here have a Mac? No? Yeah. Okay, well, there's a couple of companies that spend an awful lot of time working on their drivers. So if you look at um, the stack of instructions, and application statements and coding. You know, this is uh, the stack for storage. And so the physical hard drive is here and the driver sits right on top. And then above this is the scheduler and the file system and the application. So when we talk about scheduler, we're talking about how to schedule reads and writes to and from the disk. So there's an algorithm that helps make reads and writes random or direct uh, more efficient. And then you have the file system sitting on top of that. But Apple computers spends a huge amount of invested time and energy. They only have certain um, chipsets and circuit boards, motherboards, and hard drives that they precisely define. They specify the hardware. Nobody else gets to do that. But then they spend a lot of time tweaking the drivers, very high performance drivers. If you run Windows on a Mac, you are likely to outperform Windows on any other platform. And that's on slide 32. And I would say that's probably worth mention, mentioning, okay? Just so you understand the criticality of the drivers where uh, the hard drives are concerned, right? So, all right. All right, so hard disks, it talks about the sectors. When they talk about sectors, they're talking about the physical the physical space on the magnetic media, and that's mapped to the inodes and the allocation units. So inodes and allocation are virtual representations that are sitting on top of sectors that are physically um, designated on the hard drive. 
You can change the way the sectors are mapped on the physical media if you do something called a low level format. It's like a factory level kind of thing. Um, but what I want you to understand the most is that sectors are physical uh, delineations of data storage directly on the surface of the media and inodes and allocation units are a virtual uh, logical concept that, that sit on top. So you might have 10 disk sectors for a given inode or 100 sectors for a given allocation unit. Does that make si sense? Yeah, it does. Okay, so if I'm talking about the, the allocation of physical storage, and then I throw terms around like inode or allocation unit, and then sectors is one of the answers. That's your, that's the one you want to choose. So sectors is a term that has to do with the hardware on the, on the interface. So the interface for the hard disk knows how to access the different sectors. Oh yeah, it says 512 bytes or 4096 bytes is the typical size of a sector. Yeah. All right, uh, platter, that's the disc itself, uh, the metal round thing. And then um, it's got the magnetic film. The spindle is the center axle, the, the rod that it spins on. So when it says spindle, it's talking about the rod inside there and the surface area. Yeah, you can do multiples on a spindle, yeah. Oh yeah, so cylinders. So you have more sectors the further out you go on the cylinders. You have an internal cylinder and then they're concentric circles. And as the, as the head is reading, it knows which track to follow because of which cylinder the data is stored on. So there's uh, physical geometry involved. The thing I want you to understand is that cylinders are concentric circles like the grooves of a record and that you have more sectors the further out you go because of the surface area. Does that make sense? Does it also make sense that the head has less distance to travel to access the internal sectors as opposed to the distance it would have to access if there were fragments of a data file on the outside? I mean, visually, does that make sense? Yeah, it's just further away from the center. Yeah. So if it's closer to the center, the sectors are closer together. The, 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 read, the read and write actions of the head as it wiggles back and forth. Everybody saw the video, right? You all saw the video? Yeah, we did. Well, I do. Right. So what are the tracks? They're the radius or radii. So, so cylinders are the concentric circles, tracks are the radii, they intersect, and then you have the sectors, right? Numbered sectors. This is oversimplified, but there's literally tens of billions of these things on a terabyte drive. So this is just a very small view. Just remember tracks are the radius, the, the boundaries that extend out. Any questions? No, we could. Okay. The head's moving on the arm. It spins. It spins very fast. So multiple read heads, cylinders, platters, and then there's these two videos. Um, it, it, would it be fair if I said, okay, I'm absolutely going to pull one question from the assessments out of these videos? Have you all seen the, the videos? Yes, no. Oh, I'm going the other way, sorry. <coughs> so if you're reading 12, <clears throat> obviously there's spinning in geometry. It's a lot of geometry. That's why you have um, dedicated CPUs and firmware. If you think about it, why do you have 
firmware, a miniature operating system and CPU and memory, it's because just to make that work, it's, it's marvelous. All that goes away when you go to solid state drives. Okay. So the servo, the drive, that's, they're talking about the motor, the electric motor. If I say servo, we're talking about motor. Slide 47, the term servo, it, uh, mm, servo, wait a minute. No, I'm gonna change that. Does anybody know what a gyroscope is? Um, I, I don't recall. Okay, so a gyroscope is a two spinning tops. One's vertical and one's two, two spinning discs. One's vertical and one's horizontal and it doesn't move when it's spinning. Oh boy. Um, I think in physics, I saw it. So. Yeah. So, okay. So when I talk about a servo that um, I'm going to take back what I just told you, the servo has to do with the, it's, it's a locational reference. So it's the mechanism that is important for uh, locational references. So the, the servo, all right, it says it keeps the head on the track. It's the rotor or the motor or the armature, there's all sorts of different words that mean motor. But when you see the word servo, I want you to think of gyroscope. Uh, it's a fixed, it's a way to fix or identify the, the three dimensional and geographic location from a constant reference point. And, and the servo's function is to help with the geometry that has to be referenced to find which sector is where for a given cylinder and a diff and a given track. Does that make sense? So, yeah. So this is just a slow motion version of what happens when heads are red and right? you're transferring data. There's a lot of extra leg work in there. Um, so seek time, a lot of your disk performance times are in milliseconds or microseconds or nanoseconds, depending on the nature of the physical resources that are used for the disk. But um, milliseconds, single second milliseconds is actually at the top end of, oh my gosh, this is so slow. So if a normal hard drive uh, took four to 10 milliseconds to, to read on average, and it had to take all of those different allocation units and stitch them together, it would be one huge chunk. Um, it, would, it, would, it would be incredibly slow. So for normal systems now, all right, 7,200 RPM. In servers, 15,000 RPMs, rotations per minute. So this, the, the disks spin 15,000 times in a minute. That's an awful lot of, that's very high speed, right? So when you spin faster, you get higher data transfer rates. That's the thing I want you to know about 60, slide 64 is that the rotation rate in rotations per minute, it's the spin rate. The common consumer grade laptop hard drive has 5,400 RPM. A business grade business PC or business laptop would have a better quality of hard drive that would go 7,200. Servers run 10,000 or 15,000 for performance reasons. And then they raid them. Any questions on spin rate and what effect that has on data transfer? So the faster it goes, the more you can, the more quickly you can access and the more data you can transfer, both, okay? Okay. All right. Yeah, it's giving you relative comparisons. So some of this information is really dated, but yeah. So which kind of workload is fastest sequential, right? If, if, if 
the sectors are defragmented. So we mentioned defragmentation and how it's a performance enhancement. If you had to sequentially access the series of sectors, but they weren't in a row, in a continuous row around that disk, wouldn't that slow everything down? The short answer is it yes. Would. Yes, it would. So if your hard disk is, is defragmented, so what do we want to know about slide 66? If, you're, if your hard disk is defragmented, then sequential is the way to go because that's going to transfer a whole lot more. But let's say you had a really fragmented hard drive and you never did maintenance on it. You never did disk optimization. You never did disk cleanup. And all of the disk, all of the data files were like randomly located in different sectors all over the place. Which do you think would be fastest, the sequential or the random? The sequential. Sequential. Actual, actually random. <laughs> so depending on the, all right, so let me see if I can explain this. Depending on the disk usage scenario, having, having a disk access algorithm that works a random, uh, a random algorithm, right? It's going to do better hop, skipping, and jumping around. And if your data is all over the map, then it's going to be better suited to access that data all over the map, as opposed to a sequential data access method that's got to go in order one after another. Oh, let's hang on until we get around to this next allocation unit. Oh, let's hang on until we get around to the final one on the last cylinder, right? So, so what happens is, is it, sequential is great if, I just want you to remember, random can be better depending on how sorry um, the disk maintenance is and how how fragmented your disk is, okay? Oh, okay, so here are disk specifications. It shows the Cheetah. So which one, which one do you think is a server disk? The one uh, Barracuda. Well, if you want bulk storage, yeah, the terabyte is larger. So if all you're interested in is volume of data, then you can use Barracudas. So let me rephrase the question. Which disk would make for better throughput on a high performance server that had to deliver more data throughput? Cheetah. The Cheetah. Cheetah. Yeah. Now you see what happens here. This has more volume right? This has more speed, but not as much volume. You see that a lot with uh, disk IO. Uh, 